At least 30 minutes, right? Yeah, um, 27. <laughs> Twice? Oh, only 27. So just uh, a, a little disclosure. My, my background up until about four years ago was on the carrier side. I was at Anthem for 20 plus years and then out of Seattle for a couple of years. So typically as a, as a corporate person I was for 20 plus years, I didn't go anywhere without a giant PowerPoint deck. So today I thought, well, I'll do a little something different, less formal, even though I have the suit on, and I would do a little bit of a discussion. I was asked to talk a little bit about small group, large group, and, and what a consultant role looks like. Of course, I didn't realize I'd be the only slacker without this big PowerPoint presentation, so I apologize. Uh, but I'll try to make it uh, somewhat short since I'm the last person as well. So small group, uh, there was already a, a number of things discussed. The superintendent, I, I thought, did a terrific job outlining some of that. And oftentimes when we talk about healthcare here in Maine, and I've spent 25 plus years of my entire career on the healthcare side, we, you know, a lot of times we talk about the jumbo employers, when in fact it's, it's smaller employers that make up the backbone of our state here in Maine, right? That, that's really what drives the economic engine here in the state. So a couple of quick numbers. Uh, really there are three primary players when we look at small group. And when I say small group, that's employers uh, with less than 50 FTEs. Okay? Just so everybody has a, has an idea of what I'm referencing. So again, I'm not gonna pick on anybody. I've worked for insurance companies for a long time, so if I mention a couple of names, it's really not to pick on folks, okay? But it is just to put things in context. So I, I think and you mentioned you're a small group, right? So you mentioned you're in so that's not unusual. A small group community health options is out there. Their average increase is about 12%. For Anthem, it's 15. And, and again, not to pick on Harvard, it's around, it's around 20, right? So if you're in that space, that's the sort of increase you're seeing. So I'm not telling you anything new. The other thing that happens in small group that I think um, is an issue, and I thought it was an issue when I was at Anthem as well, is that the rates are really only released 60 days prior to the renewal. And so that by the time you get that digested and delivered, your window is really short on what you're able to do is you know, an impactful decisions and big decisions, right? When you look at your P&L statement, you look at salaries, and then you look at the cost of benefits. They're always one and two on the P&L. So I think that really should be looked at holistically. <coughs> what could be done to get those rates out maybe say 90 days or even 75 days, I think it would be a, uh, really an advantage for employers um, to do something of that, of that nature. Uh, the superintendent also mentioned the small, you know, small group self-funding, right? So that actually has, that's been around for a, a long time. Uh, there's a couple of carriers that aren't around anymore that actually uh, has, had self-funded small groups. It really never got a lot of traction. And I'll tell you, it, it didn't really receive traction here in May until, until Aetna put out a product four or five years ago. And they went to the market and said, hey, we have a solution for small employers. Instead of just going to the community rated market, you could sell fund your, your small company, okay? Now, as the superintendent mentioned, there is stop loss coverage in there to protect you. So you are buying some really uh, additional insurance protection for large claimants and that sort of thing. And I, I won't go down that rabbit hole. Um, and it has been really successful, but to the detriment to the small group market. And, and the superintendent mentioned that, right? So when you saw the numbers go down in his chart, the number of employers in the small group, employees in the small group market has gone down, right? The rates continue to go up. And a significant chunk of small group has moved to self-funded. So they've come out of the community pool so what happens? How do you become self-funded in that small group market? Your employees have to fill out individual medical questionnaires, okay? They're gonna base the rates on some of that, and they're gonna base the rates on also running a pharmacy report, and they're gonna see what type of prescriptions people are taking within your population, okay? They then will say, okay, here's your rate, self-funded rate. Or they're gonna say, no thank you, the risk is too great. And then what case, what happens to those folks? They stay in that community rated pool. Okay, so I think, I think superintendent mentioned that spiral potential. And we saw this in the individual market a number of years ago. So this does continue to be a, a problem.
problem in the small room market. I'm not sitting here saying that you should do this or you should do that. Uh, they're tough decisions to make. I will tell you, even with the significant, significant increases that we're seeing on those self-funded plans, they still are typically less than what's in the community rated market. So we have clients that receive a 25, 30% increase on that self-funded plan, and they look at the community rated pool to see if they should go back there, but it's actually still less uh, in the self-funded market, okay? So there's a lot of different dynamics that are going on in small group that I think just makes it a, a really tough space, and I think it makes it a difficult space to regulate uh, as well, okay? So I just move real quickly uh, into large group, and Disclaimer, I spend most of my, my time in, in large group. And when I look at large group, I'll say right up front, I'm a big proponent of self-funding if you are in a large group market space. And large group doesn't have to be five or 600 employees, it doesn't. It could be 150 employees and up. And if you go, if you go lower than that, then it, it, it becomes a, a bit volatile. I think you have to ask yourself two questions if you're thinking about self-funding, either a small group or, or a particularly large group, and that is cash flow and risk tolerance. That's really what it comes down to. And if, if you can answer those questions honestly, or your CFO can, or your CEO, then I think that's a great discussion to have with your consultant. Okay? I, I was up doing a presentation with a, a, a relatively new customer, and then frankly a large one, 500 employees, and uh, we had a discussion at their board meeting around self-funding. At the end of it, the president pulled me aside and said, hey, great presentation, but remember, I'm a bank, I'm not an insurance company, so I'm not sure I really want to go down this self-funded road. So what does that mean? That basically means risk tolerance. It really is not a cash flow issue with this particular customer, it's more risk tolerance. What keeps you up at night, okay? So those are really the things you need to kind of walk through. So a lot of people think, okay, I'm gonna self-fund and I'm gonna save a whole bunch of money, right? Well, that, that may or may not be true. And it's dependent upon how your claims run, right? So there's no silver bullet. I can't sit up here and say, hey, let's do this and that, and you know, we're gonna reduce your cost by 10%, 12% or something of that nature. Really what I like to do when I talk about self-funding, I like to talk about plan design. What can you do around plan design that can impact those numbers? impact those claims costs, right? There's the administrative cost over here in this bucket that's relatively small, and then you have your claims piece, okay? And that's really the piece you ought to be focusing on is the claims. So I, I really, uh, somebody had mentioned it earlier, but I, 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 one of the things that I like to do is to take a look at centers of excellence, okay? Where should things be done for heart transplants, Cancer, other other um, options are bundled payments. I'm not sure if people know what bundled payments are. But bundled payments are you're going to be paying something, say for a uh, hip or knee, and we're going to pay one fee for that entire episode around a knee or hip, and you're going to want a warranty on it. So if something goes wrong, you don't have to pay for it twice. Okay. So there's a lot of different payment mechanisms out there when you're self-funding that you can do around plan design that I think gets at more of the cost equation and that's the claim piece, okay? Um, so that, that I, you take a look at that. There's something I did in Seattle uh, with the state of Washington. They, they had 250,000 members on this particular state of Washington account. Is we went to an infusion therapy. In infusion therapy, we did outpatient, but we set up clinics to do that for a home therapy as well. And we were able to save the state of Washington millions of dollars by moving some of those into what I would say is a bit more appropriate care. Uh, some of the carriers have programs to do this, but again, on a self-funded basis, you're able to do some of these things, move those costs around to really more appropriate places to have the service, and frankly, probably you know, more convenient, particularly the home infusion therapy as well. I'm gonna talk just quickly about a pharmacy and if that's been discussed a lot, I, I agree that have taken some, some bullets. So you, you'll hear a couple of things like transparent PBM, right? Um, what I would say is, is I'm more interested in getting at the cost. So, so pharmacy is really kind of a black box. There's a lot of things that go on behind, behind the curtain that the you know, average consumer doesn't understand uh, and isn't 
frankly not privy to. So what we've been doing a lot of is shopping the pharmacy separately from all the other products that we have on the medical. So don't bundle. We de really kind of debundle it, if you will. I mean, we will shop for um, pharmaceutical uh, PBMs that are more in the line of transparent, and that is they're, they're, they're giving rebates in full. They're charging an admin fee. They're not doing this for free. And they, they aren't not for profits, okay? They're going to tell you what their costs are, they're going to tell you what the admin fee is, and then everything else, the ingredient cost, the spread pricing, the, uh, the rebates will all be passed right back to you as the plant sponsor, again, on a self-funded basis. So we're, we just did this exercise for a, a client, and it's a sizable client, it's a little over 500 employees, and we were able to save them just in one year about a quarter million dollars by moving them to a different pharmaceutical PBM. Okay, so that doesn't happen with all. I'm not gonna say again it's a, a magic bullet, silver bullet, but there I think all of those things need to be looked at when you look at your, your health plan. I just think putting it on autopilot is just not an option when you're looking at the increases that I mentioned. Even on a on a fully insured large group basis, the, the trend out there, does anyone know what, what the average trend is right now in Maine? medical, it's between eight and 10 percent, okay? So even in large group, if you, if you think you're running well and you're doing okay, I tell customers, you still need to budget an increase of somewhere in the eight to 10 percent neighborhood. So when they're doing their budget, we don't have the renewal yet. The CFO calls me and says, Mike, what should I budget for the upcoming year? Unfortunately, I'm still telling them eight or 10 percent as a, as a placeholder, right? On a big base number. So it's it's um, it's it's really becoming really unsustainable uh, in my opinion. Last thing I'm going to mention, and really I'll, I'll move off here since we're so far behind, it's just the broker role. And I'm really not here to do a commercial. There's a lot of terrific brokers uh, here in Maine. In fact, I don't really care for that term. I, I actually prefer consultant. And really, what you should look for in a consultant is really a trusted business advisor, and that is somebody that you feel that is helping represent your interest uh, in the market, particularly around health care, disability, life insurance, dental, and, and all of the products that you may offer. But someone that you feel is truly a consultant, somebody that knows the market, um, somebody that can be a trusted advisor to your company, and uh, somebody that uh, really has an understanding specifically of what's going on here, here in Maine. Okay. So uh, with that, I will jump off and pass it back because I know we're Yeah, we are.